This video combines Nick Mickey and Ethics Book 7 and also 10. Those are the focus of the last part of our discussion of Aristotle's Nick Mickey and Ethics. That is our last part of our discussion prior to our consideration of the critique of Aristotle by feminists. Uh, and uh, we'll look at that uh, a little bit later. We'll be doing that in class. So let's proceed. Uh, book 7 is about incontinence. And as I've already indicated a number of times in class, incontinence is the lack of the ability to keep sufficient control over oneself. In contemporary times, the term is used in advertisements uh, for uh, depends undergarments and others because of issues of urinary incontinence. And you see more and more of these images on television because our population, a significant portion of our population is growing older. And as they grow older, they have more difficulty with urinary incontinence. So there are various pads and things that people can purchase uh, for that problem. But here we're talking about incontinence in the matter of moral philosophy. So incontinence is when you slip up, when you make a mistake. Not that you do it all the time, but it means a lack of continuity or a lack of, of, of stable and continuous uh, ability to control oneself. And in other words, what is it about? It's about how it is that people who are otherwise pretty good occasionally screw up. How do they, how do they make bad choices? So the question is this then, first of all, is it about a lack of knowledge? For Aristotle, well, yes, it is. It's a lack of knowledge, and then also it's not a lack of knowledge. That is, it's the lack of an ability to bring to the forefront of our consciousness our knowledge and understanding to bring it fully to bear when we're in a situation where we're practically doing things, that is, we're doing actions and making choices. So you may very well know that uh, excessive, uh, buying sugary, uh, sugary cereals at the grocery store will increase the amount of sugar in your body and maybe it'll affect your uh, ability to concentrate. And a great deal of sugar, eating a great deal of sugar is not good for you. You know this, but if you go shop grocery shopping when you're very hungry, and you see a breakfast cereal that you've had before and it tastes good, then you'll grab it and put it in the cart thinking that it's good food for you. We're easily, easily, uh, uh, easily distracted and uh, from our ability to fully understand what we do and understand the implications of it when we're hungry. So it's difficult at that time. And so there is a certain lack of knowledge, namely the knowledge is not brought to the forefront of our consciousness. If it were in the forefront of our consciousness, then we perhaps would not do it. We would not purchase that kind of cereal. Now Aristotle thinks that this incontinence, or this lack of consistency, is in a sense a problem of knowledge. That is, we, may, we, we think about something and we make a wrong choice with regard to knowledge. And so he says we have the notion of a practical syllogism. Now, a syllogism is a form of argumentation for Aristotle, which we'll see in just a moment. And practical means that it has to do with action. So uh, we're looking for a, a kind of reasoning or explanation of our action, and, and uh, this can uh, help us figure out what the right thing to do is. Or it can be an analysis of understanding how it is that we do mix things up and get things wrong and screw up, so to speak. That is, what happens when we are incontinent with regard to our moral choices? For Aristotle, this can involve ignorance of the universal. So you may not understand, you may not know that what, what you're doing is stealing. Or you may not have that at the forefront of your consciousness. You may have the idea that because you work for so-and-so and he doesn't pay you enough money for the work that you do, you think you should be paid in, uh, in a... Uh, uh, paid more money, uh, paid in a fuller way somehow, and then you decide, well, then uh, I suppose uh, I should take some pencils or pens or something. So it could be that we really don't understand the, the universal and how it applies, and maybe it's because of the pressure on us. But we really don't understand the universal. We don't understand what, what it is to steal something maybe in these cases of office supplies and that sort of thing, then we don't really think that it counts as universal. So that's not really stealing. Uh, so there's, there can be ignorance of, universe, of the universal. You really don't know exactly uh, what the activity is, or perhaps you don't know that stealing is wrong. 
uh, in some sense. So there's also a particular ignorance of the universal, uh, and that is in a particular case, you don't know what it, you don't know what the universal is, what the universal law or rule is in this particular case. And again, we can be distracted by our wants and needs to misjudge things. There's also ignorance of the particular, so we may not know exactly what this particular thing is. We did, that is in the case of of something that uh, we're taking, we may we may think that it's there as a gift for anyone who wants to take it, when in fact it was not. So this this was not a particular instance of a free gift. Rather, because of our ignorance, we stole something, and it's our own fault. We should have we should have understood that pens or or purses or whatever were not being given away for free, but maybe we wanted it so much that we thought, well, there's no sign saying you can't take it, therefore we must be able to take it. So you see, in each of these cases, there's a kind of failing here. And there can be particular ignorance of the particular. That is, in this particular situation, you're trying to judge something and figure out what it is, and you just get it wrong. So there are various ways that our wants, needs, desires, that is, our emotions, can overcome our reasoning and cause us to make false, uh, false judgments in regard to these matters. And so... Uh, I, I, you'll recall, go back here, you'll recall that I spoke in class about uh, Mrs. Fields' chocolate chip cookies and how we can make a mistake there. That is, uh, we can say that Mrs. Fields' chocolate chip cookies are good. My doctor told me to eat foods that are good. Certainly Mrs. Fields' chocolate chip cookies are food. Therefore, uh, my doctor has ordered me to eat lots and lots of Mrs. Fields' chocolate chip cookies. But of course, I've misunderstood the sense of good food here. And I did it because of my weakness, because I wanted the cookies, because I let my emotions take over my mind, or I put the real meaning of something in the back of my mind. People who steal sometimes think that it's some, that they're just taking something they deserve. And of course, they're overwhelmed by the fact that they want the item, or because of the particular circumstances, they feel the job, the, the boss is cheating them somehow, and they rationalize. In the, in the pejorative sense, in the sense that they make up reasons why it's okay for them to do something which otherwise they should easily recognize as wrong. So this is what Aristotle is talking about when he talks about incontinence. That is how it is that we are confused in our thinking and we slip up. We don't do what's right or we give in to our, our, our desires. And the desires overcome our clear-headed reasoning. Just as at the grocery store, our desires for for our food of some kind or another, overcomes our clear-headed reasoning as to how much cereal we should buy or something of that sort. So, uh, uh, so another way to look at it then, with regard to this notion of incontinence, it's a practical syllogism and it's practical because it aims at action. It aims at doing things, not just knowing things and drawing conclusions, but doing things. I'm trying to think about whether I should buy buy this particular cereal or something of that sort, uh, and I try to rationalize it in various ways. Now the syllogism, the basic syllogism for Aristotle has this kind of logical form. The logical form is this, A belongs to all B, B belongs to all C, therefore A belongs to all C. So that's a for straightforward syllogism in a very straight way, very clear, uh, very clear how it's, how it's set up. But we can mix this up in various ways and make bad judgments due to our emotional state. So Aristotle introduces, though, here the moral element, because he brings in the notion of what one should do, because in the practical syllogism, we're trying to think through the right action. And we can, again, we can make mistakes because of our emotional commitments, our wants, our needs, our desires, and we have to be careful about that. Remember that, that we're concerned with the rational part of the soul, the, pardon me, the non-rational part of the soul, which is able to listen to reason. And so we're trying to let our reason be our guide to fulfilling ourselves properly and establishing virtue in ourselves and fulfilling ourselves as people who are seeking out happiness in a kind of ultimate way. We're seeking the fulfillment of ourselves as much as possible. So, I should always eat good food. Chocolate is good, and it certainly is food. Therefore, I should always eat chocolate. But of course, here there is an equivocation on the notions of good and food. Good tasting 
as opposed to healthy and good for oneself. Reasoning in this way then plays a central role in all of our actions, but that reasoning can be disrupted by desires, needs, wants that distract us from realizing the truth, the real truth about what we're proposing to do. This, of course, is very common in advertising and in political speech. Consider the marketing of sugar-free cookies. Why, if they're making sugar-free cookies, would they put on the box, these are sugar-free cookies, and put it in large letters, that sort of thing? Well, uh, maybe they have it, if you look at the, at, at the uh, if you look at the ingredients, there's other substitutes there for sugar, but there's no sugar in those cookies. So if you buy sugar-free cookies, does this mean you're free to eat as many as you want? While if you had regular cookies that had sugar in them, you'd have to limit yourself. Marketing them as sugar-free cookies makes them more acceptable to us under the notion of, well, sugar, eating too much sugar is, too, is bad for me, therefore, maybe I should refrain. But if I buy the sugar-free cookies, I can eat the entire box, and it won't be bad for me. Or the notion of ice cream that has no sugar added. In, uh, in recently in purchasing some chocolate fudgesicles, I, I noticed that they each had 40, 40 calories for each of the fudgesicles, and it said no sugar added. Well, no sugar added means this certainly must be better for me because it doesn't add any extra sugar. So it's another marketing ploy in that sense. It makes it, the marketing makes it more enticing to you. It gives you permission because you're not doing something uh, detrimental to yourself, or at least you're led to believe that. And here we have an example of Twizzlers, uh, a, a candy that, um, uh, that, as it says here, is artificially flavored with strawberry, but the package says, as always, a low-fat candy. Well, they could also say a low-cholesterol candy, too, couldn't they? Because there's no cholesterol whatsoever in Twizzlers. Maybe they should have put that on there. And so with no cholesterol at all in Twizzlers, certainly I can buy them. But like the notion of low-fat candy, of course there's very little fat in, in Twizzlers because it's mostly sugar. And once your body has the sugar, your body will develop the fat. So the, the lead, what, the, what the package leads you to thinking here is, because it is a low-fat candy, then I can eat this candy without the worry of gaining lots of weight because I'll be adding fat to myself. But no, don't worry about that. Eat the Twizzlers. Your body, from the excess sugar, will make the fat. So this is an advertising ploy, but it's playing with our understanding of the words and their meanings. And so since it's a low, low sugar, a low fat ca candy, then it gives you a kind of permission to take advantage of it and you have as much as you want because you're eating something that's low fat. Disregard the fact that it's, it's full of sugar. So this is the kind of thing that happens with regard to the practical syllogism. We think through we, we think through things with our emotions. And so key phrases like sugar-free or no sugar added or low fat, these are all moments of, of permission uh, for us to, to buy these foods because surely they're better for us than the regular kinds of foods. But in fact, that's a marketing ploy. So, but the reasoning involved here, and it also concerns our own weakness because we want these items we then think don't don't do not think so clearly about them when purchasing them. Now I want to move on here in this discussion of, of incontinence to talk about the various characters for Aristotle. First of all, let's be very clear: we're talking about states of character, and and virtuous is only one state of character. Vicious is another state of character as well. But there's other states of character in between in various ways, and that's what Aristotle wants to talk about here. I've selected out just five, but these are five of the most important, and it gets across the basic idea for Aristotle. So let's look at each of these in order and explain what, what's involved with each one. First of all, the virtuous person. So this is the person of excellence, and the person knows what is right, because the person has used his or her rationality, is not tempted to do what is wrong, and in fact does the right thing. So this is the virtuous person, the ideal of the virtuous person. 
Now, a little different from that is the person who is continent. The person does not slip up, or call them incontinence is about slipping up on things, or, or making a small mistake, or being weak. That's mostly what it's about, uh, incontinence. Continence here, though, means that you know what's right, may be tempted to do what's wrong, but in the end, you do the right, thi do the right thing. We say that such a person is continent. But notice the difference between the two. The virtuous person is not tempted in any way, shape, or form to do what is wrong, whereas the continent person is tempted, but overcomes that temptation and controls it and does the right thing. So, uh, so with regard to the conception of the person that Aristotle has here, for Aristotle, it is possible for there to be a person who is virtuous. But in contrast, in the Christian tradition, no ordinary human being is able to be perfectly virtuous. Rather, in, in the Christian tradition, one strives to become continent. That is, knowing what is right, being able to overcome temptation so that one doesn't do it, and then one does the right thing. However, in the Christian tradition, which is foreign to Aristotle, of course, uh, in the Christian tradition, most human beings are regarded as incontinent. That is, everyone slips up, everyone sins. Uh, except, except Jesus and also perhaps his mother, depending on the theology of how one understands that. All right, so, uh, so the incontinent person, that involves knowing what is right and being tempted to do wrong, and for the most part doing what is right, and occasionally this person does the wrong thing and when doing the wrong thing, this person has regret for it because he or she knew it was the wrong thing. So that's the incontinent person. It isn't something habitual. It happens occasionally. But it's due to a kind of weakness of, of, the, of the person with regard to temptations. So occasionally the person does the wrong thing. Not always. And when the th wrong thing is done, the person has regret for it. The simply incontinent person is the one who knows what is right, is tempted to do the wrong thing, and because he or she is so weak, this person always does the wrong thing and still has regret for it. I'll illustrate these in just a moment or two. I guess I have to pause for a moment. Just let me get this done here. So let me resume now. I had a couple of telephone messages here that distracted me. So the incontinent person knows what is right, is tempted to do the wrong, and this person is weak. And so the incontinent person occasionally does the wrong thing, but has regret for it. The simply incontinent person is always incontinent. That is, simply here means absolutely or always incontinent. That is, the person is extremely weak, and whenever offered the opportunity, uh, then the person cannot turn down the opportunity for doing the wrong kind of thing. This person knows what is right and is tempted to do the wrong thing, always does the wrong thing, and still has regret for it. Because the person knows that it was wrong. So this is just a pure, almost complete weakness. The vicious person, in contrast then, the vicious person is one who knows what is right, is tempted to do what's wrong, always does the wrong thing and has no regret for doing it. In fact, this person enthusiastically embraces the wrong thing. Now let me illustrate this in a very concrete way with regard to cigarette smoking. So the virtuous person is the one who knows what is right, that is, cigarette smoking is bad for you, knows that it's right not to smoke. The virtuous person is not tempted to smoke, and the person, the vicious person, does not smoke. So the person does the right thing. The continent person is the one who knows what is right, is tempted to do what's wrong, but still does the right thing. And so in this case, this would be someone who has, who has uh, uh, stopped smoking, occasionally still has the temptation, but does not smoke. So I was in that state once. So let's jump down to the vicious state, and I'll come back up to the others as well. With regard to vicious, when I was smoking, uh, I knew what was right, 
I was tempted to do the wrong thing, namely to smoke. I always did the wrong thing. That is, I, I was smoking every day and even buying cigarettes in advance when they were on sale, buying them in advance, so I'd have plenty of cigarettes for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I had no regret for doing it at the time. That is, I enthusiastically embraced cigarette smoking. And I did this when I was quite, uh, just out of high school, I, I got into smoking because it was cool. All right, now I went through various stages and some of them were very disappointing. To my, I was very disappointed with myself. But uh, so when I was a vicious, a vicious smoker, I came to know that this was not a good thing. So I wasn't perhaps completely vicious and I decided to try to quit smoking. But it was very hard. The first thing I, I did was I became simply incontinent. That is, I knew it was right, namely I should stop smoking. I was tempted to smoke. I always did the wrong thing, and I had regret for it. So I would hang out with my friend Jack, who smoked, and Jack, being polite, would ask, would you like a cigarette? And I always accepted the cigarette from Jack. I regretted doing it, I regretted doing it because I was so weak, but I was still addicted to cigarette smoking. I then moved to another stage later, and that is I became incontinent. That is, I knew what was right. I was tempted to do what was wrong. Occasionally, I did the wrong thing. And when I did the wrong thing, I regretted it. So occasionally, I would slip up as I was trying to quit smoking cigarettes. I would occasionally slip up and have a cigarette now and then. Now, that all ended for me when I went on a two-week vacation. The first week of the vacation, I really wanted a cigarette terribly hard, uh, terribly strongly at the time. And it was rather shameful, I thought to myself. It was, I was struggling with this, and I, I was really disappointed in myself. The second week, though, it changed. And the, sec and the second week, I didn't, uh, I didn't have the desire for, uh, for cigarettes at all. Now, I woke up one... Well, I'm not, that's not quite right, though. In fact, I woke up one morning, and I had a very intense desire for a cigarette. And I was really disappointed in myself. And so what I did to punish myself, so to speak, I went to the refrigerator at six o'clock in the morning and popped open a beer. And then I also cut myself a piece of cake and, some, and, and put some ice cream in a bowl for myself. So for breakfast, I had a beer with cake and ice cream and it tasted terrible. But I was disgusted with myself about wanting a cigarette and, and I said, well, try this instead. At least it isn't a cigarette. And finally, though, I, after two weeks, I was able to quit. Now, it took, 15 years later, I mean, that was back when I was 25, 15 years later, then uh, I found at one time that I had a very intense desire for a, cig for a cigarette. I could smell it and still taste it and remember it. I was really, really shocked that my brain could still remember this. But that meant that I was just a continent person because I was still tempted. I remember being in Paris and it was a dark and stormy evening and it was a kind of existentialist moment and it just seemed the right thing to do as I smell, I could smell the cigarette from the people next to me. I came very close to buying cigarettes. I didn't do it, but I was very close and I was really quite shocked at how, how weak I still was that I would be tempted. Now I finally made it to the point of being virtuous. And that is, I don't have any desire whatsoever for a cigarette. When I sell, smell cigarette smoke, it doesn't uh, strike me as anything positive. Although I still do remember what it was like to smoke. And the rush that one gets from a cup of coffee and a cigarette first thing in the morning. I remember that, but it's no temptation to me at all anymore. So, enough of that. All right, move on. Now, why is intemperance worse than incontinence? Now, my, the, ways I, the reason I pose that question is I want to be sure that the, these words are disambiguated. That is, you don't regard these words as saying the same sort of thing, but understand how, uh, how different they are. Intemperance is a lack of moderation, and it is a vice. Incontinence is a weakness of, of the human person with regard to various choices for what's what good and right for that person. So the incontinent person is weak and appears to be worse off because he's weak, while the intemperate person 
seems to be strong and enthusiastic about his desires, and so he seems to be more powerful and more in control. But that's only seeming, because the intemperate person is doing something bad to himself, say with, this, with cigarette smoking without any, any regrets and, uh, and smoking a great deal. Whereas the incontinent person is on the right track, knows what is right, and strives toward it, and for the most part attains it. So notice this then. Intemperance is a vice. Incontinence is a state of character that is weak and sometimes involves slipping up and doing the wrong thing. Whereas the intemperate person always enthusiastically pursues what is wrong. Perhaps out of a sense of pride, perhaps out of a, a desire for the pleasures involved, but those are the reasons. Now, what about responsibility with regard to these? Well, remember that for Aristotle, we make our own deliberation and decisions in these matters. We spoke about it already. I spoke about Aristotle and agency uh, earlier. That is, we are agents in our own action, and to the extent that we do the action ourselves and we choose it, we take on the full, full moral responsibility for the action. And we choose it by way of our, our souls or our self for, their, for Aristotle. So given that we are obliged as rational beings and adults to deliberate about our, our actions, that is to think over the possibilities and know what we're doing, so deliberating and deciding means we take full agency, full control over the actions, and those actions are ours, be they good actions or bad actions. But that was the connection that we've seen already before, that to take full control and full responsibility for one's actions involves not only it be up to us, by, up to us not by force or coercion and with knowledge of particulars, those are the criteria for voluntariness of action, but two more had to be added on because Aristotle said that children and animals can have those first three, namely the voluntary action, but rational human beings as adults have the ability to deliberate and then to make a decision. And the first principle, he says, of moral philosophy is decision. That is the principle that must be present if we're going to be responsible moral people, uh, and I mean responsible in a positive or negative way, we must make the decision. The decision must be up to us. All right. Now, he transitions, Aristotle trans transitions here in Book 7 into a discussion that he's going to take up again in Book 9. The, what, he what he raises here is the question of the nature of pleasure and happiness. Now, to say that pleasure is identical with happiness is to express the doctrine of hedonism. The Greek hedone means pleasure, so it's as it were pleasureism. So a hedonist is one who says that happiness is, is pleasure. Anything that gives us pleasure gives us happiness. So when we seek after happiness, what we're really seeking after is only pleasure. Usually the focus is on pleasures of the body uh, when we talk about these things, but of course there are also pleasures of the mind in uh, reading beautiful poetry, hearing wonderful music, many other pleasures as well. They're not just pleasures of the, of the body, or even thinking and reasoning uh, can, be, can be great pleasures to us too. If we really think something through and then I've got it. I understand how that works. This is, a, this is a pleasure of the mind, much higher. But hedonism usually stresses the pleasures of the body. Now, he doesn't give much of a discussion of it here, but he just prepares the way for what he says in Book 10. In Book 10, what we're going to focus on in the next, just the next few slides is the, notions of, the notion of pleasure and the notion of real human happiness according to Aristotle. And, of course, this real human happiness, according to Aristotle, is something we took up in the very beginning of the discussion of Aristotle. So, again, what is pleasure? Well, pleasure seems to be something that we seek, at, we seek after, and, and it somehow stimulates us in a way that we regard as positive. See, I'm being very vague about this because in another two slides I'm going to give you the definition for Aristotle. But notice that there can be good or bad pleasures. So the good pleasures are those that are attached for Aristotle. The good pleasures are those that are attached to good activities. And the bad pleasures are those attached to bad activities. According to Aristotle, pleasure in itself is neither good nor bad. It's a kind of stimulation and enjoyment that we, we receive, but we can get stimulation and enjoyment from things that are bad. 
we can enjoy stealing from someone and having the thing that was stolen. And we have pleasure from that, perhaps. But that pleasure is bad because it's involved in immoral action. And certainly, certainly it must be the case that uh, with regard to uh, uh, molestation of children, that people who do this get pleasure out of it. But the issue is that it's a bad pleasure because it's a wrong thing to do. The activity itself is wrong. And, and yet some of those same activities, sexual, se sexual activities, when done among consenting adults, uh, allows for us then to have pleasures that are good pleasures, or appropriate pleasures, or relationship-affirming pleasures. So for Aristotle, pleasure in itself is neither good nor bad. But it's de what determines the pleasure to be good or bad is the activity to which it is attached. If the activity is right, then that's a pleasure that is good to pursue and good and right to pursue. If the activity is wrong and perhaps harms an innocent person somehow, then that's a pleasure that should not be permitted. You should not allow yourself that because the activity itself is wrong, even if it results in feeling good or some, having some kind of pleasure. No. For Aristotle, pleasures in themselves are neither good nor bad. They get their nature as good or bad from the activities to which they are attached. So Aristotle in this is absolutely and unequivocally rejecting hedonism, the notion that all pleasure is good. Now, as I said, for Aristotle, pleasure arises in the context of an activity, but it is not itself an activity. Pleasure is consequent upon an activity. We do something, we play basketball, and then we get the pleasure of playing basketball. So, so the, uh, that's consequent upon some activity, or we, we have to uh, complete a job of some kind, and we do the job, and we complete the job, then we have the pleasure uh, that we have, uh, pleasure in feeling that we have completed the job that we've done. So pleasure then plays the role as the culmination of an activity. When we do what's right in a difficult circumstance, we get the pleasure of realizing that it was difficult, but we, we did the right thing. Now, here's, here's Aristotle's statement on pleasure that I want to go through with you in considerable detail. So let me read this out. Why does everyone desire pleasure? This helps us understand what pleasure is, but why does everyone desire pleasure? He writes, we might think it is because everyone also aims at being alive. This is extremely important for Aristotle. So right here, he's explaining to us why we like pleasure, why we pursue pleasure. It's because it's being alive. It, it makes us feel alive. Living is a kind, he goes on, living is a type of activity and each of us is active toward the objects he likes most, in the ways he likes most. The musician, for instance, activates his hearing in hearing melodies. The lover of learning activates his thought in thinking about objects of study, and so on for each of the others. Pleasure completes these activities and hence completes life, which they desire. So pleasure is a completion of an activity. So when the musician plays, the musician, the musician wants to hear the melodies and gets pleasure out of the melodies properly accomplished. And so pleasure is the completion, and pleasure draws us into the activities. It entices us into activities, but of course we have to be sure that we have the right activities. So pleasure, in, so pleasure is a completion of activities of life, and we desire activities of life. So Aristotle goes on then, it is reasonable, then, that they also aim at pleasure, since it completes each person's life for him, and life is choice-worthy. Choice and that's from Aristotle 1175a, 12 to 18, the lines, the uh, pagination indicated on the side of the page of your books. So what about happiness? Happiness is not a state, but an activity. All right, so you don't, you don't have happiness and just rest in contentment of the activity. But rather to be happy is to be in the process of fulfilling oneself. And so for Aristotle, being happy is an activity. It's a doing. It's doing something. Now remember, happiness is not identical with pleasure. 
because pleasure is the culmination of an activity. But happiness is about fulfilling ourselves as human beings. And when we fulfill ourselves and do the right thing as human beings, we feel pleased with ourselves, but only as a consequence of the activity. So happiness is a kind of human fulfillment. And as living beings, we are active and alive in seeking our own human fulfillment. So in this sense, in everything we do, we are seeking happiness. But of course, that's where we started our discussion with Aristotle. We're all seeking happiness or the human good. So for Aristotle, the happiness we seek is that of the person of excellence. Namely, we want the happiness of the person of virtue. That is a person who acts in a virtuous way. That is a person who acts in a, an excellent way, is an excellent human being. And the excellent human being attains happiness or fulfillment through the use of one's own natural talents uh, and habits developed, habits of virtue developed, and through use of our rationality in the development of those habits. And all of that leads to the development of good character. So the attainment of happiness is best done by people who are of good character for Aristotle. Now for Aristotle, happiness is of two kinds. And this he discusses in Book 10, uh, Chapter 7 of his Nicomachean Ethics. The first kind of happiness is the first kind of happiness is that which is available for the people working at the highest level of rationality. Why do we say that? Because happiness is not pleasure, it's fulfillment. And, the human, and human beings have rationality as an essential tool regarding what they are. And whatever the fulfillment of a human being is, it will necessarily involve rationality. And so human nature as rational indicates that the function of, the, of a human being is to use rationality, and Aristotle reasons that the highest kind of rationality yields the highest kind of fulfillment or happiness. So the activity of reason in theoretical or contemplative study, we're using rationality at the very highest level, this is the highest possible fulfillment for human beings. Now, this is not something open to everyone, but only to people who have special talents and have, uh, have excellent teachers to help develop those talents. And then they practice those talents and push them as far as they can toward human fulfillment. So this, for Aristotle, this is a small group because it involves intellectual excellences. That is reason at the very highest level. So that's the, the highest kind of happiness uh, in Aristotle. But there's another kind of happiness that's also for the good citizens. And I regard myself not as the first, but rather the second. That is a person who seeks to be a good citizen. So the good citizen can be the mail carrier, can, can be the operator of the, of the recycling truck, can be a teacher, can be a, a writer, can be all sorts of different things. The a person of, of the second kind of happiness can be. But the key is that they are good citizens. And not only do they have virtue in their own souls, but they also have virtue in the context of society. Perhaps they don't have the highest kind of excellence because they do not have the highest kind of rationality in which to manifest themselves. Human beings vary with regard to intellectual talents. They also vary with regard to the opportunities for teachers and also for the socioeconomic resources for the development of their own education. So this highest part I'm sorry, this, this second level here is excellence for Aristotle because it's the realization of virtue in practical things in the world, in society. But it's second best because it doesn't attain to the highest level open to human beings. That is an extremely high level of rationality involving the intellectual virtues. So both are kinds of happiness, but given Aristotle's definition of the human being, that the human being's function is to is, is to use reason in the attainment of fulfillment, then it follows on Aristotle's reasoning that the highest kind of happiness available is available through, through reasoning at the highest level. The second highest kind is through good moral action, good habitual moral action, again guided by reason but not high intellectual excellence, uh, this, ki this kind of good citizenship that's available to all humans. So, given this, the questions arise, is Aristotle an elitist? Answer is, yes, he's an elitist. 
but he gives good grounds for it. The people who have higher intellectual ability and achieve more than are fulfilling themselves more than others do. And this may be only because they had educational opportunities or to, to manifest their own natural talents. But still, they have the highest kind of fulfillment according to the definition of a human being as a rational being, seeking happiness and fulfillment. This is, in a sense, a meritocracy, then. That is, the people who merit, uh, merit, the, merit this the most attain the most amount of happiness. And they merit it through their own hard work and the use of their talents to the extent that they can. Aristotle's ethics, then, is perhaps somewhat confusing, both, both a virtue ethics and a eudaimonistic ethics. Virtue ethics, because it stresses habits and the contextualization of these habits uh, in a society, but also eudaimonistic ethics because it aims toward happiness. Eudaimonia is the Greek word for happiness, and eu means well, and daimon means spirit, so eudaimonia means a kind of well-spiritedness. But well-spiritedness is brought about, this well-spiritedness that we call happiness, is brought about best, according to Aristotle, through the establishment of virtue in the soul. So, in contemporary philosophy, we can talk about a kind of virtue ethics and it, that puts people in good order and right action. Uh, or we could talk about a, a, an ethics of happiness that determines what the highest kind of happiness is and we figure out how to pursue it. And so that does it for our discussions of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, books 1 through 3, 5, 6, 7, and 10. I think this is quite enough. We'll be discussing these in class, and also, though, after this, we will be looking at the feminist critique of Aristotle. I think you'll find that quite interesting. So that's all for now.